Chapter 7 Kala Chakra Chakra Vartan Shambhala is sometimes described as like a pure land, a place beyond the reach of ordinary travel. Initiation is said to establish predispositions for rebirth in Shambhala, not only for the sake of maintaining practice of the Kala Chakra system, but also for being under the care and protection of the Kulaka Rudra with a wheel when the Great War comes. Jeffrey Hopkins The psychological experience that is associated with the UFO consists in the vision of the rotunda, the symbol of wholeness and the archetype that expresses itself in mandala form. Mandalas, as we know, usually appear in situations of psychic confusion and perplexity. C.G. Young While the Chinese systems we looked at in the previous chapter demonstrated an extension of the Egyptian journey to the underworld as an interior spiritual process, the Indian concepts take that one step further. While the Taoist adepts understood that they had to internalize the stars of the Dipper in order to align themselves properly with that asterism, the Indian sages identified each of the stars with specific areas of the body, called chakras or wheels, along a central pole, and discovered neurological and psychobiological analogs that enabled them to accomplish the same feat. For the Indian adepts, as for the Chinese, each of the seven stars of the Dipper had associated deities, passwords, mantras, and other attributes that helped train the mind of the practitioner and prepare him or her for the celestial ascent. Also, the Indian system of sacred architecture reflects the same concepts as those of the Chinese and the Egyptian with its emphasis on the North and the Pole Star in orienting temples. Immortality and celestial flight are also traditional aspects of Indian mysticism, as we will find out. Ancient astronaut theorists have cited something called the Vaimanika Shastra as a text revealing flying saucer or Vaimana technology, as experienced in Vedic times. However, it has been demonstrated that the Vaimanika Shastra is a 20th century channeled work and as such does not reflect genuine Vedic sources. While not a hoax, its value in terms of this discussion is not very great. For that reason, we will not spend any time discussing its claims, as that would get in the way of the genuine Vedic and Tantric material which is far more fascinating and revealing than the Vaimanika Shastra. Like many ancient scriptures, the Vedas record the flights of gods and other beings, often in fantastic vessels. This fact alone is suggestive of some kind of experience or contact with human or quasi-human beings that were able to travel through the air an experience that became associated with various legendary or historic events in India's past. The period in which the Vedas were composed usually is ascribed to the middle of the second millennium BCE, or about 1500 BCE to 500 BCE. Thus, the Vedas were being transmitted orally in India about the time of the Egyptian New Kingdom and the Chinese Shang Dynasty. It is believed that the information contained in the Vedas is considerably older than its earliest written forms and probably reflects a Bronze Age culture that developed out of the Indus Valley civilization when the latter collapsed about 1900 BCE, leading to a migration of the peoples known as Indo-Aryans to the Indian subcontinent there are many similarities between the religious concepts detailed in the Vedas and those of the ancient Iranian religion, which has led to a close identification of the two cultures. While most of the Avastas, the sacred texts of the Zoroastrian religion, have been lost 
due to the Islamization of Iran, Persia. There are surviving fragments as well as the persistence of some ancient Iranian concepts and terminology among the so-called Kafiri of Nuristan, a non-Abrahamic culture in Afghanistan that was converted to Islam only in the late 19th century and which was immortalized in the Kipling novella, The Man Who Would Be King. The term Kafiri is a pejorative Arabic word meaning infidel and the Kalash people of Pakistan, across the border from Nuristan. As we examine some of the Indian concepts related to our study of the phenomenon, we have an opportunity to compare Zoroastrian terms, concepts, and iconography to the Vedic examples. Zoroaster is said to have lived in eastern Iran about 1500 BCE thus making him a contemporary of the Vedic period in India, as well as the New Kingdom in Egypt. The Avestant language, in which the Zoroastrian scriptures are composed, dates from about the same period and has some similarities to Sanskrit, the language in which the Vedas are composed. Perhaps the most famous icon of the Zoroastrian religion and of the nation of Iran is the Faravahar, Think about the image of a bearded man sitting in a circle that contains spokes like a wheel or rays like a star and which itself bears two great wings. It is said to be a version of the Fravashi, a kind of guardian spirit. Also consider the case of the Assyrian god Asher. The rays or spokes clearly are the circle or wheel behind him. The two long curls that descend from the circle of Ahura Mazda are on top of the circle. Thus, we are looking at a persistent motif that probably had its origins in Mesopotamia among the Babylonians and Assyrians, and which later made its way to Persia. It was a familiar icon of supreme divinity, a human or human-like figure flying above the earth in a winged rayed globe. In the case of Asher, we have the god holding a bow, an instrument of war. In later images, the being carries a ring. The following example is from the Nimrud excavation by A. H. Laird, and currently on view at the British Museum. This stele dates from the mid-9th century BCE. In this case, the god is shown holding a ring in his left hand. It is obvious that he is flying. He is shown in the air above the standing figures, and if we apply a certain perspective to the art, assuming the god is at least as tall as the figures on the earth below, we can propose that the god is far above the standing figures, and perhaps deeper in the background. Various explanations have been advanced for this design. Depending on the source, it may be identified as a solar symbol, the circular sun with its rays, the wings signifying its travel across the sky, or as a symbol for divinity itself. The human figure in the disk may indicate the god of the sun, for instance. In ancient Sumerian iconography, the symbol for divinity is an eight-rayed wheel or star. It is believed that the original form of this symbol was used to designate Asher, the Assyrian god, who may not have been a solar deity. In fact, the origins of Asher are not known with any degree of certainty. He was considered among the Assyrians to be the great god or the ruler of the Assyrian pantheon. At some point, the symbol for Asher became the symbol for Ahura Mazda, the supreme god of the Zoroastrians, whose name may have been derived from Asher. Ahura is an Avestan word, which is derived from the Indo-Iranian word Asura, which is then identified with the Sanskrit Asura. This is important, for it points to a specific conflict between classes of divine beings who are at war with each other. In the Indo-Iranian context, the Asuras are angelic beings who fight the Devas. 
from which we get both the English words divine and devil. In India, however, the devas are benevolent beings and the asuras are malevolent. The common denominator is conflict, and especially conflict between two non-terrestrial camps. This conflict is experienced by human beings in some way. And even those stories about this conflict make their way into the sacred texts of different cultures. There is no immediately obvious reason why they should be included, since they do not have a direct impact on human life or development. Indeed, the strange way in which the Asura-Deva conflict is reversed. In Iran, the Asuras generally are benevolent. In India, they are malevolent. May indicate that human beings have taken sides in the conflict. In fact, some scholars point out that the word Ahura in the Zoroastrian texts sometimes refers to human beings or beings with human characteristics who are military commanders or otherwise have exceptional abilities. The term is used to refer to human lords as well as to other lords of the same lineage as Ahura Mazda, the supreme god of the Zoroastrians. There thus seems to be a connection between divine and human rulers, with the human rulers partaking of some sort of essence of their divine counterparts. The Zoroastrian usage of Deva indicates a category of gods that are rejected and will later become known as demons. In India, the Devas are gods, or as Kumaraswamy has suggested, angels versus the titans of the Asuras, beings that are nevertheless consubstantial. This last is an important point for it is consistent with other views, such as those in the Abrahamic tradition, which state that the devils are fallen angels. There is thus a degree of consubstantiality between the angels and the devils of Jewish and Christian lore, which reflects the same kinship between the devas and the asuras, whether in an Iranian or Indian context. This general agreement transcends geographical boundaries and religious cultures. There was a war in heaven, a conflict between the gods, that eventually had ramifications here on earth, as humans were enlisted to support one side or another. This conflict is highlighted in the doctrines of Manichaeism, a 3rd century CE religious movement that originated in the Persian Empire with the prophet Mani. 216 to 276 CE, who was born in what is now Iraq. Mani's religion was heavily influenced by Jewish, Christian, and Gnostic ideas concerning the creation of the world and the struggle between forces of light and darkness. He composed an elaborate cosmological system with different levels and stages of creation including a scheme of cosmic wheels, which are set in motion by the gods. At one point, evil, in the form of male and female archons, or sons of darkness, is transformed into a giant sea monster, who is slain by the Light Atomus, the Dragon Slayer, and who is then stretched out from east to west and the north to form the cosmos, in an obvious reference to Mesopotamian creation literature involving Tiamat and Marduk. The war between the powers of light and darkness began before the cosmos was created, before the creation of human beings on Earth. This was a conflict that had its origins before what we would call the Big Bang. According to this doctrine, the powers of darkness were contained in the south, while the powers of light occupied the other three quadrants of north, east, and west. Obviously, if there was no cosmos as yet, and therefore no sun and earth, cardinal directions did not yet exist. But this narrative should be interpreted allegorically. This dualistic concept of primordial reality 
is reflected in many other cultures, such as the yin and yang of Taoism. In Manichaeism, light is trapped in darkness, and the cosmos were crafted as a large wheel, which would separate the light from the darkness and send the light back to the realm of the gods. In a sense, then, this was seen as a refining process, and as such, is cognate with ideas in alchemy, which see gold, the perfect metal, as trapped in baser materials, requiring only the dedication and perseverance of the alchemist to separate it out. Many of the original Manichaean scriptures have been lost or destroyed, some at the insistence of Zoroastrian and Mazdian officials of the Persian Empire, who saw the new religion as a threat to their hegemony. Regardless, Mani's influence spread to India, where it is said he sojourned for a while, healing the sick, and to China, where a Manichaean temple is said still to exist. Manichaean religion and doctrines spread as far west as Africa, but as far north as Europe and England. At one point, it could be considered a world religion, as it stretched from China to India, Europe and Africa in its heyday, and lasted for more than a thousand years. It influenced such later Christian heresies as Bogomilism and Catharism both of which are well known for their relationship to the Templar legends and the iconic Holy Grail. One of Manny's major influences was the Book of Enoch and its associated Book of Giants, copies of which were discovered in Qumran in 1947. The Book of Giants is especially interesting as it is based on the story of the Nephilim a controversial term found in the biblical book of Genesis and its relation to the story of the Great Flood. Made popular by ancient astronaut theorist Zechariah Sitchin and discussed here in an earlier chapter, the film has been translated variously as fallen ones and as giants. Once again, we are in a strange territory. The persistent idea that there was a kind of genetic abnormality. There is even evidence that the term understood by Manny to mean giants and monsters was also used to mean abortions on the earth that was somehow linked to affairs in the heavens and which resulted in the Great Flood is found again in the writings of Manny and especially his version of the Book of Giants. It is a familiar theme in alien experiencer circles that hybrids exist on Earth who have genetic donations from both human and extraterrestrial sources. One can suggest that these hybrids would be equivalent to the giants, monsters, and even the fallen ones of biblical and Manichaean doctrines. What is interesting is the fact that it is somehow necessary to talk about giants monsters, and fallen ones at all in this context. Be that as it may, after the appearance of these genetic abnormalities, there is the scenario of the building of a vessel, and of the escape of a small number of human beings, along with collections of animals and plants, from the ravages of a deluge. We saw this not only in the Mesopotamian context, but also in the Aztec context. Different races of beings in conflict with each other and the survival of one race after a flood. The biblical version insists on a supernatural or extraterrestrial context for the conflict that led to the abnormalities and from there to the flood and the survival of a small fraction of humanity, presumably those not affected by the genetic misfiring. The Vedic text Satapatha Brahmana, composed about the mid-first millennium BCE, also recounts a story concerning a flood, being the earliest known Indian flood legend. In this case, it is the story of Manu and Matsya. Manu is a human being, and he is warned by a fish-like creature, Matsya, of an upcoming deluge. 
He prepared a ship at the appointed time, boarded it, and the floods came. When they subsided, the ship beached on the summit of a northern mountain, as in the biblical version. Manu descended from the ship and began making sacrifices in order to produce offspring, for he was childless and evidently without any human companions. A woman was produced from the offerings of the sacrifices, who called herself the daughter of Manu, but with whom he produces the rest of the human race. Other later versions of this story are present in the Mahabharata and the Puranas, with some differences and further elaborations. The reason behind this arcane history lesson is to introduce some of the Indian concepts concerning alien contact and to show that there is some commonality of themes running through the sacred texts of the world's great religions. What seems to be myth and imaginative storytelling to modern eyes had a different reputation in ancient times. These were the records of events that had taken place for which, as we have said repeatedly, a scientific vocabulary was not available. Eventually, some core aspects of these records became the basis for practices and beliefs concerning traffic between the stars and the Earth, through the medium of non-terrestrial, non-human agencies. By understanding this, we can better approach the modern experience of alien contact and alien abduction by seeing them as aspects of a phenomenon taking place along a continuum from ancient times to the more familiar and contemporary military, government, and personal documented accounts. As vocabulary became more precise, more specifically designed around scientific terminology and concepts that were based on observations and measurements of the external world, human language changed accordingly. Scientific vocabulary became the lingua franca of commerce and technology and contributed to a widening gulf between religious and spiritual concepts on one side and the language of the real world on the other. As language underwent this separation, religious and spiritual vocabulary became devalued over time. And this has contributed to a kind of atrophy of the human understanding of the role of psychological and emotional functions of consciousness. Thus has led to the current tendency to regard the language and art of pre-modern societies as swamps of superstition and credulity. At the same time, language associated with esoteric practices became increasingly encoded as writing and other forms of communication began to dominate the channels of instruction, knowledge, and education. The dominance of digital media, due to the widespread adoption of electronic forms of knowledge transmission, has led to a suppression of more analog forms, or at best, the relegation of them to the arts, music, etc., where they do not pose a threat to the technology priesthood. The results of this split can be seen in everything from economic inequalities among those who do not have access to digital sources of information, or expression to the rise of religious fundamentalism among those who sense the impotence of technology to satisfy deeper yearnings. The unspoken threat in the modern world, the gorilla, gorilla in the room, is the fact that technology has replaced religion as the opiate of the people and the backlash of religious fundamentalists is a predictable reaction to this realization. Ironically, both sides have become seduced by machines. Sator Arepo Tenet Opera Rotas The Ratana Kaka, the ideal wheel, is described as the divine wheel that appears to one who is destined to be a Kakavati Raja, a universal monarch. The symbol of the wheel will take us deeper into some of the more esoteric aspects of Asian thought. 
The primary influence of the Dalai Lama on non-Tibetan societies, for instance, has been the promulgation of the Kalakak Pratantra and its associated initiations. The term Kalakakra means wheel of time and refers to a complex of ideas expressed both in language and in iconography. For whatever reason, the symbol of the wheel has become a central image in Indian and Tibetan religion and esoteric practice. The Kakra itself is inescapable in everything from the everyday practice of yoga to the highest and most secret initiations into various tantric sects. The wheel appears on sacred drawings, carvings, bas-reliefs, in a variety of contexts, but always as a signifier of power, rulership, and illumination. And as the previous quotation reminds us, the appearance of that wheel indicates that the observer has attained a special status. Like the shamans we discussed in the previous chapter, the Indian rulers were those who had made contact with the other world. In China, heaven is a circle. In India, a wheel. The Indian version of the wheel is described as flying through the sky. It is stated that a king having perfected the ten virtues of a universal monarch observes the eight precepts on a full moon day and then retires to the topmost floor of his mansion. When the divine wheel rises from the eastern ocean and comes through the sky like a second full moon, it circumnabulates the mansion. On the command of the monarch, the great wheel starts on its mission and the conquest of the world begins. This is obviously not a reference to a solar disk or some other planetary or stellar object, but a vehicle of some kind that only appears when the king has undergone a period of purification and right action. At that point, the wheel appears to the king, who sends it forth on its mission of conquest. Thus, the wheel is both the vehicle and a kind of weapon. This description comes from the Pali Canon, the basic texts of Theravada Buddhism, and the earliest known Buddhist scriptures. The wheel is an important Buddhist icon, and as recognizable as a symbol of Buddhism as the cross is of Christianity or the crescent of Islam. Usually it represents the wheel of Dharma, the wheel of the law, but it can also mean the wheel of life and many other associations as well. The ancient term for an ideal ruler, Buddhist or Hindu, is Kakravartin, he who turns the wheel. While the instruction concerning the king and the divine wheel may be at least partly fantastical and allegorical, the fact that a vision of a wheel the size of the full moon circling around the king's palace and then going off to conquer the world, is accepted as a valid image, indicates that ancient Indians saw similar lights in the sky and associated them with kingship and with the power to control secular affairs, power that later came to be interpreted as the law or dharma in the Buddhist context. Evidence such as this is more important than channeled Vimana documents of impossible vehicles. To be sure, it is subtler and not as striking as the weird designs of starships in the Vimanaka Shastra. But textual information such as this is relatively unimpeachable and at least as relevant as the vision of Ezekiel or the Ahura Mazda symbols. Archaeologists have suggested that these wheel symbols represent the solar disk, or the solar disk with rays radiating from it, and other interpretations which assume a near obsession with the sun among ancient peoples. That archaeological sites are demonstrably oriented towards solar and lunar positions, as well as to the Dipper, may be taken as further evidence of this obsession. How then would the phenomenon be interpreted, either textually or in iconographic form? 
It would be mentioned in such a way that no association with the sun or moon could be construed. In terms of a text, the sun or moon might be mentioned as background to the larger story, as in our example from before, in which the full moon is mentioned in a deliberate way, as being different from the divine wheel, which then behaves in a way that neither the sun nor the moon ever behaves. In terms of art, there would be details suggesting that even though there was superficial resemblance to the sun or moon, it was not to be confused with either. If an ancient observer were to see a flying disc, for instance, how would it be portrayed in a manner that makes a distinction between it and other celestial phenomena? One would begin with a circle, the basic design and the common denominator of sun, moon, and flying disc. Then one might add identifiers that suggest a unique quality of the disc, either in terms of its movement or its appearance. In the case of the symbol of Asher and of Ahura Mazda, there is a human or humanoid figure in the center of the disc. The figure holds an object or objects that suggest function, such as the bow of Asher or the ring of Ahura Mazda, clearly not objects that would be associated with either the sun or the moon, or at least not without a lot of explanation. There are wings extending from the disc, both to the sides and below. Some archaeologists or religious scholars have suggested that these are not wings, but are intended to represent the rays of the sun. If this is so, then why do the rays extend only in three directions and not in all directions? Why are there no rays extending from the top of the disc? It seems clear that these are intended to be wings, and specifically, the wings of a bird in flight. In some examples, what appear to be rays can be seen within the circumference of the disc, but not extending outward into space. These appear to indicate the spokes of a wheel, rather than the rays of the sun. This suggests that what we are looking at is a device not a common celestial object. The sun did not suddenly appear over the skies of Mesopotamia one day, causing people to wonder at it and develop all sorts of mystical associations with it. People were born, grew up, lived their lives, and died under the sun's rays since the beginning of life itself. For hundreds of thousands of years, Homo sapiens were aware of the sun, of course, as intelligence developed and the rudiments of civilization were created, including speculation about the role of human beings in the cosmos, the sun, moon, and stars became objects of veneration and calculation. Narratives were created to explain or enlarge upon observed celestial phenomena. There came a time, however, when celestial phenomena were not predictable or calculable. Comets, meteors, and other natural events were observed, recorded, and wondered about. Then, in the midst of all of that, a different kind of phenomenon took place, one that inspired the association of specific human and functional attributes to something sighted in the sky, a disk with a man in it or something like a man, with the likeness of a man, as we heard in Ezekiel. Something circular, like a chariot wheel, spinning, flying. Something not natural, but something not man-made either. Something alternatively terrifying and awe-inspiring. The closest approximation of this flying object was its similarity to a wheel. But it was a perfect wheel, an ideal wheel, one that spins without friction, one that cannot be stopped, one that spins effortlessly, one that stays aloft, the wheel of the law, the wheel of life, the wheel of time. 
Kala Kakra. The central text of the type of Buddhism most identified with Tibetan Buddhism is the Kalakakra Tantra. Since his investiture as the 14th Dalai Lama, Tenzin Gyatso has performed numerous Kalakakra initiations around the world, and in some cases of hundreds of thousands of people at a time. The wheel is the central symbol of this initiation. The Wheel of Time is a mandala, a sacred diagram that is composed of a specific number of elements in appropriate positions and colors. The Swiss psychologist C.G. Jung identified the mandala as a device indicating wholeness. When his patients had dreams of mandalas, it was evidence that they were approaching the stage of individuation, a psychological state in which the various aspects of a personality were coming together to form a harmonious whole. The appearance of the UFO, according to Jung, was an indication that humanity in general, in a state of confusion and perhaps fear, was yearning towards that state of harmony and unity and projecting that yearning towards the sky. The mandala imposes order upon chaos. Its balanced elements, usually in multiples of four, indicate that everything is incorporated into the state of order, without favor of one element over another. Such objectivity is normally beyond the capacity of human beings who cling to one image or sensation over others. In fact, the requirements of many initiatory systems make serious demands upon the psychological, mental, and emotional resources of most individuals. The suppression of physical and emotional desires, that is the hallmark of tantric initiations, for instance, as it is of monastic life in the West, may be related to a desire or need to emulate the perceived state of non-terrestrial contacts. In other words, physical and emotional states that are not natural to human beings may reflect the natural state of non-human beings. This is akin to the cargo cult phenomenon with which we began this study. The impulse to imitate the perceived behavior of colonizing powers, if that behavior is understood to be related to superhuman or supernatural abilities. This is especially relevant if the only two possible reactions to the presence of a colonizer is resistance or emulation. If the non-terrestrial power is not intent on colonizing and its actions are not perceived as threatening or repressive, then its behavior may be even more attractive as an attribute worthy of imitation. Or, as in the current global situation regarding UFOs, merely ignored. The distance created between the alien power and its human observers makes a space for the projection of ideas about that power. Human beings tend to understand the world in terms with which they are already familiar. Love, fear, hatred, aggression, greed, piety, profit and loss, life and death, etc. This is why the question always remains, why do aliens not land on the White House lawn? From the perspective of a putative alien force, why would they? We attribute human strategies to beings that do not share our evolutionary path on this planet, which is certainly a mistake. The only people on Earth who might begin to understand an alien mentality would be those who distance themselves as much as possible from the realm of human action, the better to see alternative perspectives. This does not mean that these individuals actually do perceive or understand alien intentions and thought processes, but the distance created allows room for the introduction of new and more promising ways of comprehending other possibilities through a medium that may even be nonverbal. Human language presupposes human experience related to this planet. The famous plate affixed to the surface of the Voyager 1 space probe, showing a nude human male 
a nude human female waving, a gesture that, to an alien consciousness, may have none of the associations we attribute to it, even if it is perceived as a gesture at all, along with other data that we assume would be understood by an alien being is a case in point. It would presumably be understood by other human beings, but the presumption ends there. In such practices as Tibetan Buddhism or Tantra and many others, we have systems of language, behavior, and intellection that are counterintuitive. The language of the Tantras, for instance, is known variously as twilight language and intentional language. It is a system of coded transmission that relies less on normal grammar and vocabulary and more on a network of associations and multiple meanings in order to transcend language as we understand it. That does not mean, of course, that an alien intelligence speaks this language. It does, however, provide an alternate approach to the idea of language and how it may be used as a deliberate symbol system or even transcended in order to reach a nonverbal state of communication. Experiencers often have described communication with alien contacts as nonverbal and telepathic, as the transmission of images or as sounds heard within the brain, rather than as external stimuli. Rituals such as those of the Kalakakra Tantra employ images such as the mandala in an active manner, as a language itself. They also employ sounds in ways that are not experienced in everyday life. Chanting, drumming, the low vibratory notes of the horns blown during Tibetan rituals, etc. All contribute to nonverbal communication, which relies on the active stimulation of the sense organs, without necessarily being carriers of meaning. The point of these forms of ritual is one that challenges the linear patterns of waking thought. From a Tibetan philosophical perspective, for instance, there are two types of truth. The conventional truth of appearances, in which observed phenomena seem to have real existence, are perceived as being real and as existing, and as having essential independent being, and what is called ultimate truth, a perception that these appearances are illusory, creations of consciousness that disappear during altered mental states when emptiness is perceived, and which reappear once the meditative state is abandoned. Thus, the ritual space is one in which appearances are treated as playthings or as objects to be manipulated, or even drained of their conventional meanings and usages and assigned different qualities completely. Hence the fantastic seeming illustrations of the mandalas, another Indian and Tibetan religious art, as well as the surreal drawings seen in European alchemical literature. In any coding system, letters, words and numbers, digits, no longer have the meanings usually assigned to them. This is even more apparent in analog systems, such as art, music, poetry, and ritual. In the aggregate, all of these attempts at creating nonverbal states eventually reduce to a single state of non-duality, of what is called Advaita, and which may be the result of complete harmonic balance between opposite states so that they negate each other, meaning plus one, plus minus one, equals zero, or emptiness, or even a wheel. This is the imposition of order upon the chaotic nature of a reality that is composed of appearances which, taken individually, seem to create conflicting emotions of desire and abhorrence, love and hate, beauty and ugliness, etc. Those who are seen as having transcended such states are considered either deeply spiritual by observers or as robotic or even alien. A lack of effect often is considered a sign of psychological impairment. 
Those who test high on the autism spectrum, for instance, but who are high functioning, those with Asperger's syndrome, are seen as gifted intellectually in some ways, but as lacking the capacity for human contact and response. Isn't that how aliens often are depicted in popular media? The human being who is credited with having achieved the ultimate state of enlightenment is, of course, the Buddha himself. It was the Buddha, during his first sermon at the Deer Park, who introduced the concept of the wheel as an icon of the religion. In fact, one of the symbols of Buddhism is the image of this first sermon portrayed as a wheel with a deer or many deer in attendance. The footprints of the Buddha also are depicted as having wheels and swastikas. The swastikas symbolize auspiciousness in Asian iconography, but also represent the spinning of the wheel of Dharma, the wheel of the law of Buddhism. The wheel is also the primary shape of the mandala, which often is drawn as a circle or a circle within a square, or a square within a circle. This circle is heavily populated with images and colors, usually divided along four quadrants with various deities, objects, and other ornaments in their appropriate places. In the center of the mandala is often seen a building or a mountain, a literal axis mundi, which may represent Mount Kunlun, or Mount Sumeru, or Mount Kalish all peaks representing the center of the Earth horizontally and its vertical connection to the pole star. The fact that mandalas are more often than not divided into four quadrants brings back to mind the cruciform ideogram for shaman that we discovered in the previous chapter. In the Indian and Tibetan forms, however, this concept is magnified greatly. The ideal wheel as interpreted by the Buddhist commentators, he is resplendent in gems, gold and silver. The aspect of the wheel that is emphasized is its ability to shine and reflect light. The center of the wheel, the nave or hub, is described as being made entirely of sapphire, which is the same gemstone that we encounter in the vision of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 26 as the substance of the throne in the center of the wheeled vehicle. Around the sapphire nave is a silver lining, and then more gems, etc. This is the same wheel that was perceived as flying around the king's tower, and in one Buddhist text, we heard that it proceeds through the sky, not very high, but just above the summit of trees, so that those who accompany the wheel through the sky are able to enjoy the fruits, flowers, and tender leaves of the trees. It moves at a height that is neither too high nor too low, so that people on earth are able to point out and say, that is the king. This is obviously the description of a vehicle in the shape of a wheel or a disc that is observed by people flying through the air, and which also boasts passengers who are presumed to be the lords of the earth, the Kakravarti. We propose that the mandala, the wheel, and the flying disc are cognate representations for a real object and a real event or events, during which this object was seen and was able to enter into the cultural stream. The mandala, in particular the one that represents the Kalakakra initiation, is a focal point for meditation and ritual observance, and we propose that this may be due to an effect such a sighting had on an early population. There may be some modern evidence, albeit circumstantial, that supports this theory. It may provide a clue as to the connection between ancient Asian esoteric systems and the presence of UFOs in a way not imagined by many ancient alien theorists. In 1975, famed UFO researcher and astrophysicist Jacques Vallée published his influential book on the UFO influences on humanity, The Invisible College. 
It was widely and warmly received by such notables as U.S. astronaut Edgar Mitchell, a UFO believer, and maverick scientist John Lilly. On page 197 of that book, we see a graph that Vallée created based on the number of UFO sightings in the world from 1947 to 1962. He called it the Schedule of Reinforcement and writes, Figure 3 shows the variations of an external phenomenon, the UFO manifestations, to which human society is reacting in various ways. It is interesting to ask whether this process is not subtly changing us. The graph shows various peaks in UFO sightings in certain years. The years where we have the highest concentrations are 1947, 1950, 1952, 1954, 1956, 1957, and 1962. Something about those dates triggered a dim recollection. A look through the available records of the Kalakakra initiations conducted by the Dalai Lama show two major initiations involving 100,000 individuals each in 1954 and 1956 in Lhasa, Tibet. These were the first two initiations conducted by the young Dalai Lama before his forced departure from Tibet for India after the Chinese invasions, and they occur in the same two years as important UFO waves. This is not to say that the Dalai Lama was in any way creating the UFO sightings, or was somehow directly responsible for them. But such a concentration of people during an intense ritual experience involving the Kalakakra, the Wheel of Time, may be connected in some way to the UFO events in ways we do not yet comprehend. In other words, as Valet noted, they may be subtly changing us. Not satisfied with these two sightings, we looked more deeply into the record to see if there were any other suggestive linkages between the Kalakakra initiations and UFO sightings. There were many, but a few stand out as being of greater interest. September 1976 was the month of the famous Tehran-Iran UFO sighting, in which two Iranian jets were involved. The incident was the subject of a U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency report, and the Iranian Ministry of Defense openly stated the cause was extraterrestrial. That same month, the Dalai Lama conducted a Kalakakra initiation in Ladakh, India, for 40,000 people. December 1996 was the sighting of a UFO by video taken aboard the STS-80 Space Shuttle Columbia. That same month, the Dalai Lama conducted a Kalakakra initiation before a huge crowd of 200,000 people in West Bengal, India. The sighting of December 1985, however, is very suggestive. That month, the Kalakakra initiation was conducted before another large crowd of 200,000, this time in Bihar, India. That same month saw the famous communion experience of alien abductee Whitley Stryber, which became the subject of the book and the movie of the same name. This episode is so well known among UFO enthusiasts and the general public alike that it needs no detailed description here beyond a brief summary. Stryber, a Hollywood screenwriter, was at his cabin in upstate New York when he had an experience that can only be described as a kind of abduction from his home in the middle of the night by beings that were not human. The substance of this event was recounted in his best-selling book, Communion, and eventually became a film starring Christopher Walken as Stryber. Stryber has since suggested that the experience had spiritual dimensions, as well as perhaps a psychological basis, extending back to the time he spent as a child in San Antonio, Texas, near the Randolph Air Force Base 
where the Nazi scientists involved in aviation medicine, brought over under the infamous Operation Paperclip, were based. This experience changed Stryber's life forever, and he has since been a tireless advocate of the UFO phenomenon, as worthy of serious attention and as evidence of a spiritual change taking place on the planet. Belay agrees that the UFO experience is changing us in subtle ways. He links the experience to a kind of control operation by a force or forces unknown. In fact, in The Invisible College, he shows comparisons between UFO experiences and religious experiences, thereby drawing some similar conclusions. That religion often functions as a control mechanism is not to be doubted. But what if the UFO experience stems from the same source, as we have been insisting all along? To go even further, what if our understanding of the mechanisms of both religion and UFOs is so flawed, we cannot entertain the possibility that we can take charge of the mechanisms ourselves? Those who do, or who profess that they do, are often isolated from society and ostracized. Certainly, actions that are not consistent with acceptable human behavior will result in exile or self-exile from the haunts of men, as one dreams the dream of heaven, to quote Lord Byron. This occurs either naturally or accidentally.